Hi everyone, welcome back to Smug Mug Live. This is episode 67. Thank you so much for joining wherever you are in the world. I can see already many of you in there in the chat window letting me know that you're here. So thank you for joining us. Smug Mug Live, as always, is brought to you by Smug Mug and Flickr. If you're looking for somewhere to store all your images online, showcase those images in an incredible photo website, or have an e-commerce solution, then check out everything we have to offer at smugmug.com. Or if you're looking to store your images online but be part of an incredible photo community, then check out everything we have to offer at flickr.com. As always, give yourself a shout out in that chat window. I can see some of you in there letting us know what part of the world you're joining from. That is always fun to see where you all are in the world. And yeah, if you have any questions at any point today for our guest, again, put them in the chat window. Start your question with the word question. That way I can find it easily in the chat. And hopefully we'll get through as many questions as we can. But I'm really, really excited to have today's guest. So without further ado, let me head over to Canada and we will join Don Comerica. Hi, Don. How are you? Alistair, I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me on. This is going to be a fun chat. It is indeed. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, we've had a few chats over the last few months and I thought it was about time we had you on Smug Mug Live. So thank you very much. And are you well and safe and sound? Yes. Well, I mean, uh, safe, maybe not sound. Sanity has been slowly <laughs> slipping away. I feel, especially this time of the year, I've been losing my sanity one snowflake at a time. But that's just me. Well, that's a lot of snowflakes. <laughs> so be careful out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've been so looking forward to having you on this show. I've known your work for such a long time. Delighted that you've been using our product Flickr and that community there to host your images for you said somewhat over a decade now, I think, right? Yeah, well, it was one of the very first places where I started to put my work online. And uh, and in fact, uh, websites that I've had have come and gone and, and some images have sort of disappeared in their locations, but they're always there on Flickr and I could always go back to it um and uh and see yeah don't go back to the very beginning of my Flickr stream because it's really amateur hour uh, if you go back far enough but um it's uh, it's a great way to display your portfolio worthy images or really just anything you want to share with the community don't spoil it. it's the first place i go is people's page one it's great to see where people started <laughs> and where they where they've uh where they've ended up yeah, i'm not taking them down i'm, I'm leaving exactly. all that stuff up there that's really yeah fine. leave it watch see your own progression as you've uh progressed in this career. Uh, so how long have you been photographing for? Uh, you know, I've been, well, more than a decade, uh, but I'd say about a decade uh, and a bit professionally. That's when I started to make my uh, my images that I knew had uh, merit that that could be sold or licensed or that I could start to teach other people how to do the same thing. So um, it's been a while, but, you know, I, if I look back, um, I could have never predicted uh, where I would be right now in my career and the kind of stuff that I do. Um, I, I guess I, I kind of owe it to uh, to my dad. Um, he's uh, he's since passed on, and he didn't get to see me become a professional photographer. But um, when he was uh, he was fairly ill, long term illness, and um, he gave me an envelope with some money in it just to you know see me enjoy something while he still could. And uh, I had no interest in photography, but I knew that my dad had a lifelong love of it. And I went, I bought a camera um, and uh, we were able to reconnect uh, over photography and uh, I uh, slowly got better and better at it. And uh, now I'm kind of living his dream. And, and I, I feel great about that, uh, that, uh, that I've been able to turn it into something, uh, you know, as valuable as it, as it currently is. But if you were to talk to me before that moment, uh, and uh and say hey don you know you know what you're gonna do with your life i wouldn't believe you not for one second um so it's uh, it's amazing the turns that we all take in life absolutely and, and what a great uh gift that he gave you and what a legacy he's created with the incredible photography that you now take now most of us will know you for your macro photography um and that is certainly something we're going to focus on today uh but where you know, I probably know you best from your uh, your podcast, right? Photo Geek Weekly, uh, where uh, yeah, you get down in geeky pretty much every week, right? 
Yeah, well, and you can find that at photogeekweekly.com where, uh, you know, I, I might miss a week here and there. So please forgive me. I'm not getting paid for it. So You're um, it's just it's one of those uh, labors of, of love where I get to sit down with a, a, a friend uh, and colleague. Uh, oftentimes it's our mutual friend, Steve Brazel, um, who, uh, you know, we find four or five stories in the photo news cycle. It could be new patents that we start to drool over. It could be some legal stuff. It could be new camera lens announcements or something of an ethical quandary uh, that is worthy of discussion. And so you can find all of that at Photo Geek Weekly. Yeah, and indeed in the description to the YouTube video that you're watching, you will get all the links to, to Don's uh, work, his podcast his uh, website etc and we'll talk more about them later you mentioned steve brazel there you also co-host a show with steve uh the uh, behind the shot image critique show where people can submit their images again on Flickr to the uh, behind the shot Flickr group and uh, post those images for critique uh, and you and steve and, and sometimes another guest will We'll work through some of those images, so check out that as well. I'm going to go over to the chat window and say hello to some people because we have people joining from all over the world. So thank you, everybody, uh, that has posted in there. We have, let's make that a little bit bigger so we can read it. Uh, we have Cindy join us from Carolina. Hi, Cindy. Uh, Nathan says, hey, Don, joining from Toronto. Uh, Kirk is joining us from Boulder, Colorado. We have Dan joining us from the Netherlands, Potomac, great name, hi from Montgomery Village in MD, Tacoma, Staffordshire in the UK, hey Michael, how are you doing? Hi from Amman in Jordan, Ramez, good to see you again, Ramez quite regularly tunes into the show. Uh, my goodness, there's a huge list here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you've got a shout out, then you're lucky. Uh, Steve Stuart Wood says, don't go back to the beginning. He says he's going to go look now. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, lots of, lots of people in the chat. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate the support. Otherwise, it's just Don and I talking to each other, which isn't a bad thing. We enjoy doing that anyway. But the point is to share some of uh, Don's wisdom with everybody who's joining in. So let's have a look at some of your work. Before we get to the, the wintry cold stuff, which is very topical for many of us at the moment, um, let's let's look at some of these images which you shared with me. We're going to head over to your uh, Flickr site. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is this is the sort of work I know Don for. This is This is the type of work that I've always wanted to be able to do. I admire it so much. Um but just don't have the skills, the patience, the knowledge, uh, or the ants to, to do it with. So when, why did, uh, what got you into this part, this genre of photography? What got you into the world of macro? I think the same thing that got me into the world of anything that I can't see with my own eyes, you know, the uh, infrared photography, astrophotography, you know, those kinds of elements of photographic space that um, I can't perceive without the camera being a tool to uh, to help explore it. And so uh, the, the thing is, when you get closer and closer to certain subjects, it can sometimes be harder and harder to find a narrative, right? You remove the human element uh, from the photos. And, and so I've done a lot of water droplet refraction work, uh, which is really, uh, an image like this is a mix between art and science. And uh, I mean, that's really what photography is in general, right, yeah. is uh, you've got the sciencey stuff, you know, how light bends and uh, what aperture to choose and how much light you're collecting. And really the chemistry and mathematics of photography is removed from the equation now, but there's still the science bits. Yeah. Um, and then there's the art, right? There's the, the narrative. There's the, you know, what, what your own definition of beauty is, uh, you know, uh, how you work with a color palette and, and color science, which is also art, uh, perception. And I think photography is a, is a way for you to mash those two things together uh, and uh, almost like weaving one into the other. And, and the more deeply you can weave the two things together, uh, the more beautiful the results can be. So I think we're seeing uh, sort of that combination of elements at play here because we've got water droplets on uh, on a blade of grass. 
uh, blue fescue grass, I believe, if, if memory serves. Any blue grass will have a powder-like coating on it. Uh, and that makes water droplets beat up and stay very spherical. And the more spherical a water droplet is, the better it will act like a lens. Uh, and so if you place a flower, or really you place anything in behind, uh, in this case, it's a flower, it will refract an image of whatever that is inside each and every one of those water droplets. So um, some fun, simple physics at play, but if you arrange the ingredients in just the right way, then it becomes art. And, uh, and so that's what we're seeing here. Hardest part about it is getting an ant to cooperate. With. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a trained ant. You haven't, you know, you don't call it, and it does what you. No, want. no, I know that uh, Stuart Wood is uh, is in the in the chat yeah. here as well, and uh, he's got uh, pet jumping spiders that are probably much more cooperative, and uh, <laughs> uh, and they have the ability to, you know, uh, just kind of stay put and and not not truly be controlled. But yeah, th these ants were uh, an uncontrollable factor. So an entire day can sometimes be spent on a concept because no matter how much control you have and no matter how buttoned down you want it to be there's always going to be an element of chaos and randomness that comes into play uh so this this image was um this was taken uh i think about a week before uh my daughter was born who's now uh four years old mm -hmm. and uh i don't think i've had the patience to try it again ever since <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, kids kids can suck the patience out of you pretty quick. Um, so this is this an indoor shot? This is something you do? That's outdoors. That's outdoors. Um, my my wife is really hesitant about me bringing insects into the house. So yeah. uh, this is done uh, in open shade in our backyard. And it's lit with a, a flash. You can kind of see the flash angle on the bottom left uh, based on the catch lights. Mm -hmm. uh, on the water droplets, and it's kind of coming up and hitting the ant from that direction. Now, the ants, uh, they uh, they are kind of all clustered around my peonies in the uh, in the late spring. Uh, there's a, a symbiotic relationship there where the right. peonies have um, extra floral nectaries. They put out nectar before the flower blooms, and the ants are always circling around, lapping that stuff up while defending the flower from other predators. Yep. So you just poke a stick at one of those ants and it just goes on a rampage and storms up the stick and then you take the other end of the stick and you place it down and that ant just runs right across uh and uh once in a while you might get the shot to work <laughs> so you you poke you poke the ant with your you poke the, the stick in the hole the ant runs across does the stick have the water on at that point or are you putting that on afterwards no no the, the stick is just a little twig whatever but oh, i have it's... what the, the scene that you see here it's, the stage is already set uh, everything yep. is set and configured. You just need to add in the actor into the equation. So you get that uh, on the stick and then you transfer it onto the scene. Uh, oh yeah. And it's yeah. in a frenzy. This thing is trying to defend its flower. Uh, and so, um, I mean, some people might get mad at me for manipulating nature like that, but I'm just yeah. playing with ants in my backyard. I've done that ever since I was four years old myself. Yeah, Claire, Claire was asking, how do you get that ant to stay still? I guess you just answered that you don't, right? <laughs> No, no, that that's a flash image. That ant was still for just that instant, but he wasn't actually still. He was moving, so that's yeah. uh, that's all part of the game we play. Yeah, and we're starting to get into some of the the cool technical questions that people are going to ask, and hopefully, but we'll get to them. But uh, I'll jump to this one because it's very relevant to this image. Rich asks, "Are you using glycerin or actual water for the droplets?" Great question, uh, and it's one that I get quite often. It's just plain old tap water. Uh, you'll read a lot of tutorials online that talk about this type of photography, and they say, you know, add a bit of glycerin to the mixture. They never tell you how much, which I always found suspicious. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I did try that once to see that, yeah, it, it worked. But uh, aside from that one experiment, every single one of the images in, in this particular series uh, was done uh, with just plain old tap water. Uh, maybe bottled water if I was feeling fancy, but nothing, uh, nothing special. <laughs> if the budget stretched to it, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah, l great image and lots of people seeing how much they like it. Let's uh, flip to another one. This one is really interesting. Um, yeah, you could talk us through this one. So this one, I did a couple of uh, interesting uh, images here. Some people were asking like what lenses might have been used and, and what have you. This was actually done um, using a, a kit lens, the, uh, the Lumix 24 to 105 uh, f4 lens. And um, that's not a macro lens, although this mm -hmm. is very clearly a macro image. So a technique that I have been using, uh, if your camera has a high resolution mode, 
And it becomes very valuable for approximating an increase in uh, in magnification because uh, I shoot at least with this image with the uh, the Lumix S1R, which is a 47 megapixel camera body, yep. but it has a mode that can take eight consecutive images on a tripod um, that generates a 187 megapixel image, which is useless. There's no there's no reason why <laughs> I need that except that I can throw pixels away. Uh, the majority of my professional career, I was working with cameras between 18 and 21 megapixels. Yep. So yep. if I throw away 90% of the image, but the remaining 10% is still really high quality pixels, I can increase my magnification uh, or the perceived magnification that way. Um, but in doing so, uh, one of the big challenges with macro photography in, in any aspect of it is the closer you get to your subject, the shallower your depth of field becomes. Yeah. And uh, by this virtue of having an obscene resolution, I can get further away from my subject and then crop in extensively. Now, there's issues with diffraction, and don't get me started down that rabbit hole. I did a video on uh, DP Review TV recently on yep. diffraction. You can go check that out. Um, that's uh, It's seven minutes well spent to, to figure it out. But um, So there's a balance. But I didn't need a macro lens. I just needed to crop in on something. And I didn't need to use any extensive techniques like focus stacking uh, and uh, yeah, just basically cropping in some levels adjustments in, in, in Lightroom and uh, and away you go. Um, this, by the way, that what, what you're seeing in that yeah. image uh, is a wildflower seed, specifically prairie smoke. Uh, clematis seeds would behave almost exactly the same. Uh, made into a semicircle on the surface of water. And there's just a little clamp under the surface that's holding it in place and a flower that's placed in the background. Um, so very simple ingredients go into putting this together. But you don't know what you're going to create because you just come up with this idea. I'm going to play with these ingredients. But yep. how you put them together can take hours <laughs> just to figure out what your end product is going to end up becoming. Yeah. You mentioned there about the, the Lumix taking multiple shots to create this massive file. Is that because is that when it shifts the images on the sensor or moves the sensor in some way to create this bigger file? Exactly. So um, I think the Olympus um, uh, OMD EM1X um, has a handheld mode that uses as few as five frames. Uh, the Lumix cameras, uh, both Micro Four Thirds and, uh, and full frame that have this feature will take eight. Uh, I think Sony's high resolution mode takes 16 shots, but there's a lot of different companies around there that are using that same idea of an in-body image stabilizer can double as a pixel shift mechanism for high resolution shooting, so long as everything in the scene is, uh, is static and the camera's on a tripod. Yeah. And if you're going to be grabbing a new camera at any point in the in the future, take a look and see if that feature is there. Because initially, I wouldn't have any use for that high resolution until I realized, well, it's a great shortcut for macro photography uh, yeah. in a pinch, and it can work wonders. Yeah, and it's it, I guess it's like we do with pan panoramic stitching of images, but it's doing it at sensor level in the camera, right? Well, exactly. And so you still have the same field of view and, and you still have uh, everything that you would normally have, uh, except you just have uh, usually a quadruple of your resolution. Yeah. So like the Sony a7R4, which is 60 megapixels, uh, becomes 240 megapixels at the end. And um, I think the Fuji uh, GX uh, 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 GFX series, now you can have a 100 megapixel camera generating a 400 megapixel yeah. image, which yeah. again is ridiculous. There's, I, I can't, unless you're doing artwork reproduction for a national museum, there's not a whole lot of use cases for that kind of resolution. Yeah, the, uh, new, except the new GFX 100S, like. yeah, it's an incredible yeah. size of camera. But yeah, certainly in that museum environment where people are documenting photographing documents and imagery where they're trying to get to you know a detail that you you see beyond the human eye then yes there's definitely a use case for it but you've just highlighted another fantastic use case there uh with being able to crop in and one of the biggest things uh, i've learned from you and your work is when it comes to ma macro photography the distance from the subject is really important the closer you yeah, get, the it, harder it gets from a depth of field point of view. So the fact that you've just mentioned there, being able to stay far away and then crop in uh, is, is really quite important. Within limits, right? Yes. I mean, diffraction is always going to get you in the end and you got to play that balancing act. Yeah. So I'm just getting distracted by, uh, by the chat here. Uh, I'm going to pull up some comments here. Uh, 
you mentioned Stuart. Stuart Wood says he's watching Don talk while his, about his work while eating pizza. It's the perfect night. Well, I'd, happy to entertain. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we want an, we want some pizza here. Uh, don't keep it all to yourself, Stuart. Um, another another dear friend of mine in the channel uh, today, the wonderful Aunt Pruitt. Says the mad scientist photographer in the house. <laughs> so you've ah, got thanks a reputation. for being here, Aunt. I appreciate yeah. the support. Absolutely, Aunt. Good to see you in the chat there, buddy. And uh, Gary Monroe's in there today as well. I saw him going past to someone who follows the channel. I always love having lot. Gary in the peanut yeah. gallery. Hello, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, I don't know what he says. Currently just mad. I'm not sure. Uh, as in the, the mad scientist. The mad, but oh, yeah, it's a reply. Yeah, science, he can just get mad. So there we go. There we go. <laughs> it's good, good stuff. So let's let's uh, go back over and look at some more photographs because that's what we're here to do. So let's see what else I had queued up here. Um, if folk are wondering what I'm, I'm doing, so we're on we're actually on my Flickr account, uh, and what I've done is I've created a gallery of wonderful images from Don's Flickr account. So I created a little gallery on my Flickr account so that I can flick through them um, without scrolling through the thousands of images that Don has on his Flickr account. So I just grabbed some, some here to talk about. Um, another very interesting shot. So if, uh, if anybody uh, has ever had the root vegetable salsify, um, it's also here, just a, a wildflower called uh, yellow goat's beard. Right. That's the seed uh, from uh, from the flower of, of this plant. And it creates a spiderweb like uh, structure. And this was shot in almost exactly the same methodology as the previous one, using the high resolution mode uh, on uh, on the camera and then cropping in uh, in order to, well, I mean, maintain uh, perfect depth of field without focus stacking. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the subject just kind of makes itself because that seed head is really flat. And so if you get that perfectly aligned parallel to your focal plane, uh, then, uh, then you can make some magic. A, a lot of times with these images, I put a, a Gerbera daisy in the background that uh, uh, they just have a, uh, a nice radial look to them. Mm -hmm. uh, like any daisy-like flower uh, would do that. But the center is almost always a different color than the petals. And so that can give you some nice uh, you know, separation in the background, yeah. some nice gradients some, of play. Some contrast, some gradients. And I, I think what I'm taken by is, oh, my camera's actually frozen on me, so I'll let you talk for a little bit while I... Right. That. Um, <laughs> the what I'm always taken by is the the backgrounds of a lot of your images are, are really key in many ways to the the overall success of the image. So you must put a lot of thought hit, into yeah. the into the. You hit the, the nail background. on the head, uh, Alastair. Where uh, in, in landscape photography, the background is your subject, right? And and to make a better landscape image, you often find something to put in the foreground. Um, to accent, to you know, guide your eye through the frame, etc. Whereas in macro photography, the foreground is typically your subject, but the background has to be that supportive element. And uh, it, it's one of those unsung heroes of a good macro image is exactly what the background is. It could even just be a complementary color to the subject that helps frame things properly. But most people, at least when they're starting, they don't put the attention on the background. They focus too much on the subject and not the supportive network of the background or things around the edges of the frame uh, to, to help improve the image. Yeah, and I think it's sometimes it's the, the overall picture, that background, it takes it somewhat from being a science experiment to being a piece of art in many ways. And then the combination of both together creates this world that most of us never get to see. Uh, I absolutely love it. I'm very right conscious, on. folks, that I see your questions coming in. I'm not ignoring them. We will get to some of those more uh, geeky questions about gear and stuff uh, uh, down the line a little bit, but we'll continue to have a look at some of those photographs. So don't, don't think I'm ignoring your questions. We will uh, get to those. Uh, this is a very beautiful image, Dawn. Uh, kind of a fluke. Again, this was uh, a, another water droplet experiment, and I was going to try to place water droplets all over these forget-me-not flowers. Um, most of the times, the droplets, they just come from a spray bottle, and, and that's fine. That works well. Um, but occasionally, I'll try to use a hypodermic needle to carefully place just one specific droplet. Um, the uh, the needle's uh, you know, metal is very hydrophobic. The water wants to escape from it right away. Uh, and so it's very easy to place a droplet with a, uh, a metal tip needle. And in this case, one 
hung perfectly, like dangling like an apple off of a tree. And I just dropped everything. And said, no, I don't, I don't need any more. I just, <laughs> just need the one. And let's just hope that I don't knock the table or it just falls off over time before I can actually get the photograph taken. This is a, a combination approach. This uses that high resolution mode, uh, but it is a focus stacked image of about four or five different frames. Um, I, I, I needed to focus stack a little because these are much deeper than, than the seeds that I was playing with um, previously. But I didn't need to do nearly as much as I would have using traditional techniques. Would have, I don't know, might have taken 20 separate images um, if I was filling the frame properly as you see it here. And, and again, same ingredients at play. Uh, water, plain old tap water, uh, Gerbera daisy in the background, and just a different surface that, they're, uh, that the droplets are attached to. And the flower itself, how is that being suspended in the water? Is there a clamp under the water or something? There's a clamp under the surface yeah. of the water. And of course, you can't see it because uh, you, you try to get as, as low to the surface of the water so that the water is as perpendicular to the focal plane as possible while still showing you a reflection. Um, if that's the case, then the reflection will overpower uh, anything that would be underneath the water. These are photographed in, uh, in just like a, a black bowl. Uh, that has a relatively flat bottom so that I can place little clamps and stuff down there without them being off on weird angles. Um, but uh, I, I think I bought it at, at, a, at a used goods store, like we have Goodwill or Value Village or, or what have you, uh, for a couple of dollars. And, uh, and it was already black, but a can of black spray paint would, would help yeah. just, just as well in order to make sure that nothing underneath the surface of the water is seen. Yeah, I'm, I'm zooming in again on this image because the, the detail... It's just phenomenal, and yeah, that single drop just suspended from the, you know, the the fibers of that plant there is just incredible. And actually, what you're seeing in that single droplet, uh, Alistair, is you're not seeing the full flower. You're actually seeing half of the flower that's reflected off the surface of the water. The flower in the background is halfway submerged, so um, in the reflection. The bottom half of the the flower the that reflection. you're seeing in in, in, in uh, the bottom half is actually the flower itself because it's refracted yep, so and it's upside, down, upside yeah. down, and the top half is the actual uh, the, the 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 reflection oh, uh, wow. that's inverted. So, so it's, now, it's now that you mention it, yeah. <laughs> now that you mention it, there is a little dark horizon line right through the center of that droplet. So that's the the surface of the water then. That's the surface of the water. Wow, I had not noticed that. That is phenomenal. <laughs> so that's the, ref the 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 reflection. Half the flower flipped upside down. Yeah, absolutely stunning. And let's not even talk about the reflection. The reflection of the, of the reflection. <laughs> on, on the bottom. <laughs> okay, my brain's starting to hurt now, but I knew that was going to happen today. So, uh, yeah, lots of lots of physics at play in that single image for sure. Yeah, wait, let's see what's next. Oh, wrong direction. This is a super simple version of any of these experiments. Uh, again, bluegrass holds beautiful water droplets. Same idea, flower in the background. Uh, the light is predominantly on the background, not the foreground, so that the droplets, uh, the, the, the flower inside the droplets glow a little bit brighter than the surface that they're attached to. And it's just a blade of grass uh, that is clamped with the little, they're called helping hand tools or third mm -hmm. hand tools. Uh, you can get them on Amazon for, I think, under $10 um, that are just basically a heavy swivel base with two alligator clamps on them. And, uh, uh, and that's just holding it in a twisted position. Uh, just one on either side, just that's out of the frame and, and away you go. You're off to the races. And these droplets, are you spraying these or are you placing these yep. individually? Spraying? Do dollar store spray bottle. Not, nothing fancy. <laughs> He's thrifty as our Don. We like that. We like being thrifty. Well, I, I hate when people uh, stand behind uh, many, many thousands of dollars worth of equipment and say that's the only way to do it. Um, uh, yeah, okay, I have thousands of dollars worth of photographic equipment, and that's fine. Uh, but I I've, I can make images like that by taking my, my little um, Micro Four Thirds camera 
and uh, this is a GX9, so I guess it is a bit of a fancy one. Um, and just put extension tubes in between uh, the camera body and the cheapest kit lens possible, the 12 to 32 millimeter lens, which which I like, I'm, I'm a fan of. Uh, I found my lens cap for it, by the way. I lost that for a couple of years. Um, and so anyhow, uh, that can make images like you just saw. Uh, you don't need to have the big guns, uh, as it were, in order to, to make images uh, in this area. The, the hardest thing is creating a subject worth photographing and then picking up the camera afterwards. It's a two-step process and they're kind of mutually exclusive. So let's, uh, I'm going to jump to a question I saw coming in from uh, Barry, who was asking uh, about specifically some of the gear that he has, uh, Nikon D7500, Sigma 105 mil macro, but how do you gain more depth of field we mentioned there about you know the further away you are the more depth of field you have so what are some of the things people can do to maximize the depth of field when they're doing macro photography so there's three primary factors that control depth of field uh everybody's probably familiar with your aperture right the smaller you make that aperture uh, which means the bigger the f number uh the more you'll have in focus the, the greater your depth of field but there's two other factors as well one of them is focal length and the other one as we mentioned is uh your distance from your subject so if you want to maximize your depth of field then you can get a little bit further away knowing that on a camera like a d750 you could probably crop in pretty well even if you don't have a high resolution mode you've got some wiggle room there you don't have to frame things perfectly there's some pixels you can throw away um and 105 millimeters in terms of a macro lens that's about standard i mean anywhere between 80 and 120 millimeters in full frame standards is about what you would call an average macro lens and they'll have comparable depth of field uh based on that focal length being roughly the same uh if you wanted to have a shallower depth of field and you wanted to have a narrower more condensed background behind your subject use a 180, 200 millimeter macro lens. Uh, you can get 40, 45 millimeter macro lenses as well for full frame cameras. Uh, and that would give you, again, a different field of view. So a different look to your subject entirely, but your depth of field would be greater. It all plays, these numbers are all uh, affecting one another because the wider your focal length, then chances are the closer to your subject you're going to have to be. So there's no direct association where you can just control one variable uh, and say, oh, well, that's the ticket. Um, you just got to play and, and see what's going to work the best for you. I do find, however, with, uh, with a lot of macro work, especially if you want to have an out of focus background, uh, you don't want to have the background completely crisp and clear. In a lot of the images that we've been showing, the background is kind of soft. Uh, if you make your aperture too small uh, or you have way too much in focus, the background comes into focus too. And so sometimes focus stacking is a necessity where you're combining multiple levels of thinner uh, planes of focus in order so that the background can stay silky smooth and soft. Um, once you start down this, uh, this, this rabbit hole of photography, uh, you'll find all sorts of things that either work or don't, but you got to play it to your own tastes. Yeah, and in uh, you know other genres like landscape photography, we we talk a lot about finding the sharpest uh, aperture on your lens. You know, we're normally talking about f eight, f eleven, somewhere around there. Is that the same for macro photography? You don't want to just whack it to f twenty two, because then you're losing some quality. Or does that come into yeah, play? Yeah, so. Much? Uh... There's two factors here. You're right that a lens is typically not its sharpest when it's wide open, right? So if you've got an f2.8 lens, if you bring it down to f4, or f5.6 or whatever, it's going to uh, maintain better corner sharpness and just overall image quality will typically be improved. Um, and in macro photography, that's also true, except for diffraction. And uh, diffraction is the phenomenon where light will bend around an, uh, an opening, just uh, like the aperture in, in your lens. And uh, there's a trade-off, right? When diffraction starts to limit the resolution, where light is bending so far off course that it's kind of coloring outside the lines, it's hitting multiple photo sites on the sensor instead of just the one that it's supposed to be hitting, um, then things your resolution suffers from that. Uh, now, that happens with macro photography more readily than it would on landscape photography because you have an effective aperture that you're playing with. And this effective aperture um, can be as, like if I were to be shooting on uh, a lens that I use quite often, the, the Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens, uh, 
it has uh, a little chart inside the manual that says that if I was shooting at five to one magnification and F16, well, my effective aperture is actually F96. Uh, and diffraction is going to play uh, pretty uh, pretty difficultly against you in that uh, in that scenario. So it, it's, a, it's a compromise. You want to be usually a little bit less than wide open, but not so stop down that based on how much magnification you have, uh, your image quality suffers. And there's really no shortcut to that, but just experimenting and see what you find acceptable to yourself. Yeah, and if you've watched other shows on Smug Mug Live with many other guests, you will know that the theme of compromise in photography comes up again and again. So much of what we do in photography is a compromise uh, between you know apertures and shutter speeds and ISOs and physics. Uh, so yeah, sometimes what we desire isn't always possible and therefore that has to be a compromise. So Barry says, thank you for answering that. Um, he'd also was, would love to know specifically how that relates to bubble photography, which we will come to very shortly. But before we start talking about your soap bubbles, uh, I want to look at this final image uh, from a few that I selected earlier. Uh, this, this image really caught my eye, um, just a great subject matter. Uh, the play between these two, uh, is it, are these seed heads again? Yeah, dandelion, yeah. Uh, yeah. very simple. I'm sure everybody's got them on their front lawn. Uh, well, it's covered in snow right now here, but uh, typically uh, in the springtime, I'll go out and I'll just harvest a bunch of dandelion clocks and uh, I'll just stick them in a, uh, in, in a box and they will last an entire year until the next time I need more. Um, and so you can really do this kind of work any time of the year, so long as you're prepared. Uh, this was water that was sprayed from a spray bottle uh, to create the, the mass of droplets all over the place. But then I took that needle and I placed two larger droplets, one on each of those seed heads, uh, and positioned them again on the surface of water. Uh, yeah, it seems like this technique has been used and used again and again, but no matter how you slice it, the images will still have a different, uh, you know, a different feel, a different magic. And it's it's a technique that I will continually revisit because you never know what the end result is going to be. I didn't know I was going to create this image when I set out to start it. I just okay. thought, OK, well, I've got three or four hours to tinker. Uh, I got the dandelions. I got the pool of water. Let, I tried to like have some floating along the surface of the water. I tried to have them interacting side by side, trying to, to connect in together in different ways. Uh, and that didn't work as well as, as this one did. Um, uh, but there's for every image that you see, um, there's countless attempts at creating a worthy subject before I even pick up the camera. And so like an hour or two can go by when I'm, I'm just, I'm a droplet sculptor first. Mm. Uh, and then photography is is the afterthought. You know, that, that's the end goal, but you don't know what you're going to create until you start down that path. Yeah, and I love the title you gave this one because this is you entitled this one First Dance. When I saw this one, I really had that impression of two characters, you know, together. Uh, I guess the larger water droplets give the sense of, you know, a head. Yeah, to, it's to really the... hard to anthropomorphize dandelion <laughs> seeds. I, I hope I did a good job with that one. You did this one. <laughs> spoke for me. And I, I'd just like to point out to folks, uh, you know, if you if you head over to Flickr, to Don's uh, Flickr pages, you know, he does a great job of not just posting his images, but giving you a great description uh, of all those images. And there's some great conversation going on there. And of course, one of the huge benefits of Flickr is you can see the EXIF data as well. So there's a lot of information there about the camera that Don was using for that specific image, the the shutter speed and the apertures. Would these now, be... I, I will state uh, about this, Alistair, that yep. this image I made a mistake on. Mm. Um, and I shot it, I think, as, uh, at around f14, yep. not realizing that shooting with the high resolution mode, diffraction was going to come in even faster and earlier. Um, and I did that in order to make sure that I only needed the one shot. Uh, but if I had lightened that up to maybe around f11 uh, or f10 or something, letting diffraction not play as hard on the image, the image quality would have been even better. And so every time I do this, I'm still learning. Uh, it's, a, it's a constant learning game. Uh, yep. as, as photographers, we, we never know it all. Uh, and, and to be humble about that uh, means that you have room to grow. Yeah, it's, it's actually a great thing about 
the the industry and the art that we love is there's always something to learn and there's always somewhere to go so we'll never know all but the fact that there's so much information there available and all your information is something that we're very proud of at Flickr so thank you for sharing all that uh let's head over and see if there's any other questions relevant at the moment uh, uh people are loving uh, your questions uh, one from Gary thanks for your question Gary he says any plans to get smaller than water droplets and snowflakes microscopic are you going to go microscopic oh, yeah, I, I think I you have. have Gary yeah. <laughs> uh, I've uh, I've done everything from uh you know grains of sand and micrometeorites and and I actually have more of those that just arrived that um uh, that I have to you know sink my teeth into proverbially um but uh you know with microscopes your depth of field is so shallow. You know, if I focus stack uh, on a regular macro scale, I, I might have to combine a dozen, maybe 20 images, snowflakes a little bit more. The smaller you get, the, the further you have to go into that realm. And hundreds of images need to be taken uh, to, to make something as small as like a quarter of a millimeter in diameter. Uh, to make something like that uh, properly in focus from from tip to tip. So I've got uh, a number of uh, microscope objectives. Uh, the best ones that I have discovered to, to use are from Michutoyo, uh, the Michutoyo Plan APO uh, objectives, which are an infinity focused objective. So that I actually have a, I was from something else I was talking about. I've got this, this lens here. This is a super cheap lens, a Canon 200 millimeter F4 FD mount lens that I bought for I think $15. Because um, I needed a 200 millimeter lens to attach a microscope objective to. That's all it requires, just 200 millimeters, set this lens to infinity focus, put the microscope objective on the front of it, just using a step down uh, filter thread adapter, which cost me, I don't know, five or $10. Uh, and then all of a sudden you've got a microscope on the, uh, on the end of your camera. Now I've got objectives from 2X all the way to 100X. Um, I really use the 10 and the 20 more than anything else. Uh, but even at that point, it's not often, you know, the subject has to uh, be interesting on such a small scale. And that's not always the case. Sometimes the closer you get, there's just nothing of interest there uh, worthy of your photographic attention, no narrative or story you can build out. So yeah, just, I, I, I've been there, Gary. Been there. Uh, He's been I'll there already. To it. <laughs> I was going to ask you about objectives because it's it's not a word we hear very often in the industry. But objectives are the the part of a microscope where you actually look through with your eyes. Would that be correct? No. The no? Uh, in this case, uh, the the uh, objective lens is the one that is closest to uh, uh, to the subject. That's the, um, so in the bottom of the microscope, kind of on the point. bottom of the yeah, microscope. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can you can source these objectives in many magnifications and then as you see rig them oh, buy to... them on ebay do, do not buy a new one because i don't know why there's such a delta in price because uh, yeah, they might cost you four thousand dollars brand new but only seven hundred dollars for a perfectly fine used one i think it might be that people get research grants to buy all of this equipment and then when their project is done they just liquidate it all mm -hmm. um but you can find some really inexpensive and really high quality microscope objectives uh on on ebay that's where i found all of mine so while you were talking i was looking through your Flickr account and would this be something ah, that, there's one taken yeah, yep. exactly that is with the, uh, I think that's a 20 times objective that I had on there taken with a, um, uh, a, it's a Madagascan sunset butterfly wing. Yeah, there you go. That is, and that is super, super micro close up of the elements. 997 of a, of a... shots required in order to get that in focus from front to back. <laughs> It's beautiful. I'm, I'm not going to do that one again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I did it, but I did not something I'll do every day. Yeah, and as you say, probably you mentioned that you can get so close that there's there's no interest because it's it's just a boring piece of the the subject matter you're looking at. But on this particular one, it's absolutely incredible. And if you didn't know what this was, if there wasn't all this description and information and the details there, it'd be kind of hard to to get your head around exactly what you're looking at. It looks it, it almost like it metal. Reminds me. Well, I was going to say, for me, it reminds me of like colorful tapestry that you might find in a market in India somewhere, you know, yeah. like it's, it just, it just has that kind of feel to it for me, but no, it's just a butterfly wing. Yeah. I, it was like, it was, um, like beaten panels of metal or, you know, it's, it's an incredible world. Uh, and is that yeah, why you're oxidized copper panels yeah. or something? Yeah. Is that why you're drawn to this world that we can't see? Is that what you love? The discovery of imagery that just isn't available to us? By the human eye 
Uh, entirely, yeah. Uh, but I also find it valuable when I can, when I know what puzzle pieces fit together, uh, and then I try it and it still doesn't work. And then I have a moment of just kind of pondering what the what, what went wrong, what what to try next. And I, I love puzzles. And, and so when you get closer and closer to subjects like this, the puzzles become more and more difficult to sort out. Uh, so that's that's the joy of it. It's not the finished product necessarily. And yes, I love it. I love to see what, what this is. But it's that, oh, wow, I didn't expect that uh, kind of moment that I, I revel in. And I think we, we all need to do a little bit more of that. Yeah, well, I'm so grateful we get to experience it through all the, the hard work and experimenting that you do uh, on our behalf, for, for those of us that are too lazy to do it for ourselves. Uh, before we move to the bubbles, uh, a couple of questions come in, uh, some very technical ones. What size depth is the black bowl you've used for your photos? Uh, Thanks, it's, it's maybe about uh, four inches deep by about 10 inches in diameter. Uh, so, I mean, anything within that realm would work. Yeah. Uh, Gary says he's anxiously awaiting the common quantum realm shots. Uh, hold your breath, Gary. You might not have to wait too long. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, yeah, Stuart said, I started macro on an old Canon 650D. You don't need the latest and greatest gear. And that's something you speak a lot about, Don, right? You, you really can do this with some very accessible equipment. And, you know, it's it's one of the things that I've got sitting here, and I've been meaning to use it. This is the, the very first camera that Panasonic ever made, the KXL600A, sometime in the 90s. Um, it is so archaic that the LCD screen that you see on the side of it, that was an optional accessory. That was, <laughs> I you can take that off. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where the button is to take that thing off. But, yeah, it's, uh, there we go. So you would have to buy that separately. And I want to try and just see if I can make a useful image with this camera. Uh, and, uh, and if I can, well, then no, no matter what camera you have, if you take a picture and it doesn't turn out, it's not your camera's fault. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, piece of equipment. The form factor is really strange for a start. This, like a, this was in the era where, you know, I, and it's actually, you know, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, it, it has a, uh, a, a telescoping viewfinder, you know, it pops right up there. It has a built in ND filter, all fancy and everything like that. I can just flip this switch and bring on an ND filter. Yeah. Um, but this was from an era of photography where you didn't have to be rolling film through it anymore. So you had uh, probably around three or four years where people made these very exotic camera designs um yeah. that didn't have to meet any uh, any standard form factor and, and that was that was one of them yeah between not needing to standardize around a roll of film and probably watching too much star trek i think that's what that <laughs> yeah. person came up with that that form factor right there right i think it's time to talk bubbles that's what i i said we would talk about some of your winter macro photography shots today so the next section of the show we're going to talk about images like this one, not that one, this one. Nice. <laughs> um, so this is macro photography of a soap bubble. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and so I, I should state right from the beginning that the, there's a there's a recipe for the bubble mixture, and it's not a complex one, um, but it's one that you should uh, that you should memorize or write down, or maybe we'll put it in the description after the fact, or just send me an email. Um, it's, uh, six parts water. Again, plain old tap water is fine. Maybe distilled water if you want to be super fancy about it. Uh, so six parts water to two parts dish soap, just your regular plain old ordinary cheapest you can find dish soap. It's fine. So six parts water, two parts dish soap, and then one part, uh, over here, we call it white corn syrup. Uh, in, in Europe, in the UK, it's probably called glucose syrup. Um, either way, it's made of the same stuff. It's just like sugar syrup. Um, and one part of, of that. So six parts water, two parts um, uh, the dish soap, and then one part that white corn syrup or glucose syrup. And that final piece is really key 
because when you uh, make a, you know, a glass of this concoction, uh, and I use a, just a drinking straw uh, to, to dip it in, you can blow a bubble. Uh, you get to choose exactly how big of a bubble it's going to be and where you're going to place it. But once the bubble is blown and before you place it, um, the, uh, the white corn syrup will pool on the bottom of the bubble, and it will act like a cushion. So when you place that down onto, in this case, snow, it doesn't pop on impact which if you didn't include that one extra ingredient, it would be like winning the lottery to get a bubble uh, to stay. In this case, it's maybe one out of every two will, will survive. And that's, that's pretty interesting. Good odds. Yeah. Get the, the hit rate yeah. up with placing the actual bubble. So uh, yeah, maybe and, I'll and get... This is, this is lit with, uh, with two flashlights, um, mm -hmm. just simple flashlights. I mean... I just use a lot of these little um, LED uh, flashlights here. This one has a variable intensity on it, uh, but um, I, I, I have way too many of, of these flashlights. Um, so what I would do is just tape a colored filter over the front of this, uh, just gaffer's tape and just some piece of colored plastic. Uh, and so in this case, in, in this image that we're seeing, uh, I had uh, one flashlight that had an orange filter on it coming in the background, but that could be seen as just a, a white balance error if everything was solidly orange. So then I put another flashlight with a blue colored filter on it uh, and uh, lit up the snow underneath so that you had that uh, necessary separation that looked much more legitimately warm. Because people like you would criticize the image for its white balance, right? If it didn't have that yeah. conscious. <laughs> I, I know me and I know my audience. So that's exactly. Um, so we've we've created this concoction, which I'll get the, the recipe from you and maybe put it in the show notes um, if that's okay. And then it cushions, it lands on the, the, the surface. Any particular surface it works best on uh, or do you try all different I things? I've used so many different things. In this case, is snow, and that's usually a readily available thing in the wintertime, uh, especially because the temperatures have to be well enough below freezing. Um, in Celsius, that's around minus 8. Uh, I think that's close enough to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, absolutely no wind. Uh, any wind that you have around you will, uh, will destroy it. And so a, a nice calm night. Uh, will will work best up until around minus 20 Celsius or so is when you can make these images any colder than that uh, and it just freezes too quickly so there's, to there's, there's that window it's, it's interesting Claire asked is is it possible to do frozen bubble photography in the UK or does it not get, not get cold enough so Claire it's really going to depend what you mean by the UK here in, in Scotland at the moment uh, last night it was just at minus 7 Celsius which is that 20 degrees Fahrenheit spot so probably just the the the, the minimal or the the warmest it can be uh, for this to work um, if you're down south uh, you know, she says Stoke-on-Trent uh, it, it depends uh, it just depends how cold you you're going to you get do it. this in a freezer uh, yeah. and so I actually I had to buy a chest freezer this past summer because I had a documentary film shoot that I was doing and they asked for some brand new freezing soap bubble footage that they wanted to commission, but it was like May or June. Uh, mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well, if you want to uh, front me the cost of a chest freezer, I'll give it a shot and see if it's possible. Uh, one that's long enough so that I could have enough play with the flashlight and the, and the bubble and and everything else and it worked i had to compromise a little bit and lighting angles and things like that to, to, to get what they were after but uh, a chest freezer there you go anywhere in the world you can do it in africa if you want yeah it's funny i, I did say to don today he's like can we do a demo live and, and he's like no nah, i can't realize like you you trying to tell me you don't have a fridge full of frozen snow and he's like oh maybe <laughs> I actually do, and I'm growing some frost in there for another documentary yeah. film project uh, that unfortunately I can't give any further details of okay. because they make you sign away and, and be quiet about it. But yeah, a little tease. But yeah, you <laughs> definitely can do this indoors. So uh, those of you, uh, Claire, you said you're in the Midlands, Stoke on Trent. I know you. There, I know there's been a, a bunch of snow down there recently, but probably hasn't got maybe down to that kind of minus seven celsius 20 degrees fahrenheit range but yeah take it indoors or if you i guess if it's snowing outdoors you could take the snow indoors into a freezer and create this same look right yeah uh absolutely uh, or even just put some uh ice cubes in a blender 
and then you've got a, uh, an approximation of what what snow would be uh, that we're seeing here. <laughs> yeah, and then let's talk about the crystals on the bubble itself, because um, those those really oh, my camera's gone again. Sorry, folks. Uh, those really fascinate me. Tell me about how the um, the crystals form once you've placed the bubble. So there's, uh, in certain cases, there's uh, nucleation sites where the crystals will start to grow out of. Uh, and oftentimes that will start from the bottom of the bubble and grow up. Um, but I find it more interesting when those nucleation sites start floating around and you get almost like snowflake-like shapes showing up inside the bubble itself. Um, and it's important that you photograph it before uh, they all connect together. You'll notice that there's open spaces yep. between them. And that adds to contrast and it adds to, to uh, just kind of the separation of subject. Uh, and so these bubbles will freeze solid in eh, 10 seconds or so, uh, maybe less than that, depending on how cold it is. So you've got to work pretty quickly. You blow the bubble, then you get down and you're shooting. I do this all handheld uh, for these subjects because if you move ever so slightly left or right, your lighting will change and mm -hmm. you don't know exactly where the bubble is going to be. And so it, it's best to do this handheld. Um, and th this, uh, this image, by the way, it was actually taken not with my fancy full frame mirrorless camera. Th this I believe was taken, uh, with my, uh, my micro four thirds, my, my GX nine, uh, or if, if it wasn't this one, it was a very similar shot. That's nearly identical to that. Uh, so you don't need fancy equipment in order to get these images. Uh, you just need to know um, all the variables at play. So uh, in order to possibly increase the, the nucleation sites, um, I, this is totally low tech and accidental. Um, I just let this, I, I make a big vat of this, like almost like a liter uh, of this bubble mixture. I never need to use it all, um, but I just kind of leave it out and it gets dusty after a while. And the dust in the bubble solution, I think, plays into uh, making more of those uh, nucleation points in, in the final uh, uh, image. So uh, uh, now you might be able to approximate that with, uh, you know, just dusting some flour in there. I have no idea. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, every house has its own contingent of dust and you don't have to look really far before you can find some dust that you can add into a bubble mixture. Uh, and potentially, uh, you know, uh, amp so you that up a little yeah, bit. You think that particle just helps the, the kind of crystal sort it, of it, take it needs seed almost? To form yeah. around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the same thing is true of snowflakes. You know, they've got to form on something. It could be a speck of dust, a piece of bacteria, whatever. There's got to be something to start the process. If your bubble solution is too clean, then it's less likely that that would happen. Yeah. A few people interested in whether you can remember the kind of settings you would have had for this camera settings for this kind of shot? So this is tricky because you can't focus stack these subjects. They're so transient and changing from one shot to the next. I, I'm rapid fire shooting on yeah. a high speed continuous burst and ever so slightly moving the camera forward and backward just to see somewhere within that mix, I'm gonna get that exact proper uh, proper focus. Don't depend on autofocus for this. It's just mm -hmm. not gonna help you. It's gonna focus on the back of the bubble more than the front uh, in almost all scenarios uh, that I've seen anyhow. So uh, manual focus, moving the camera forward and backward, uh, your ISO is going to be relevant to how bright your flashlight is. Uh, you want to have a shutter speed that's probably, you know, one a hundredth to one three hundredth of a second, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, so long as you're stable enough. And, uh, you know, just bring up your ISO to whatever's required to get that based on how bright your light is. Uh, the real key here, and that means aperture priority mode, let the shutter speed be what it is so long as it's fast enough. Uh, but the real key would be what your aperture is set to. And for these images, you got to ride that line between diffraction and depth, right? And uh, depending on the lens and your magnification, I'll typically be shooting these images between f11 and f22. Uh, so that gives you a, a window uh, to, to work with. You'll notice the outer edge of this bubble on the, the left-hand side is getting a little bit soft, but the front is still nice and crisp. So I have to deal with the softness on the edge of this bubble that measures maybe two and a half, three inches across. Uh, that's its diameter. Uh, but that also means that's its depth front to back as well. Uh, so from the front point to the outer edge is half of that. And I don't have a whole lot of depth to play with. And you got to choose your battles there. So uh, maybe stick one stop either side of F16. Um, and uh, if 
you are shooting with a super high resolution camera and you're going to get some diffraction coming into play at that point, well, there's no other way around it. Um, it's just, it's what you have to live with. Yeah, I've seen, you've done some uh, some incredible video work of the forming of these crystals on the on the bubbles. When they completely form, when you have the crystals fill in every gap, is that when they, they typically collapse? Yeah, well, partly because if I'm blowing these uh, with my own breath, my breath is hot uh, compared to the outside air. And so when it completely, uh, you know, freezes solid, the air inside continues to cool and thereby contracts, but it's going to implode the bubble uh, as part of that process. So there's only a, a very narrow window of time before that implosion happens. Trying to create your own vacuums and bubbles of water. It's pretty awesome. Um, so we've got some more images here, which uh, maybe you can talk through because these show the kind of behind the scenes of this. Uh, well, maybe I think yeah, this actually, would be really helpful. Well, maybe maybe the next no the or next whatever one order they're in yeah let's go the yeah, order they're in but snowflake. yeah let's talk about some um, snowflakes but we, we are going to get to some of the behind the scenes images uh which will showcase right. some of the things you've been talking about so so snowflakes they're taken with the, the big guns usually and so i typically have the uh the canon mpe 65 millimeter lens sometimes even with extension tubes or additional optics on it uh, and that's because snowflakes are tiny, right? So uh, a five to one magnification lens is useful. It doesn't have to be this one. This one's like $1,000 plus. Uh, Liowa makes a 25 millimeter uh, macro lens that gets to 5X as well uh, for a fraction of the price. A ring flash on the front. Uh, this is a Canon one, but I've used a Young Nuo one uh, as well. The reason why that one's not here is because I dropped my lens recently and my lens hood is stuck on permanently now unless I want to saw it off uh which uses the filter threads so yeah my bad uh <laughs> but uh so a ring flash is what I use for that and uh, typically uh with these kinds of images you are shooting rapid fire and mm -hmm. uh, uh taking hundreds of photographs uh, of a singular snowflake so it would be uh, an advantage for you to pick up an external battery pack uh, that that just plugs into uh, into the flash. And this one has 12 extra AA batteries uh, to keep that flash uh, current with the, the rate of fire of your camera. Uh, and so, yeah, I've spent a lot of money on AA batteries over the yep. years. I mean, they're rechargeable, obviously. But, um, but that's, uh, that, that, that's the gear required to, to shoot snowflakes that I use on a regular basis. However, I've adapted uh, that Liowa lens and even some vintage lenses from the 70s uh, I've used to photograph snowflakes. And it works. It works perfectly fine. The trick with this, this particular subject matter, sort of uh, in an opposite way of the freezing soap bubbles. The freezing soap bubbles, the light's coming from in behind, and it has to uh, pass through the bubble in just the right way in order to make it glisten and shine. Mm -hmm. In this case, um, the snowflake has to be on an angle. And so that the light from the ring flash hits that angle and it bounces up to the camera and it passes, uh, you know, uh, what amounts to glare off the surface of glass, but it's that surface reflection off of the snowflake that uh, that gives it its shine, that, that makes it uh, appear very three-dimensional and showcases that surface detail. Showcases all the kind of facets of the the different exactly yeah. it's like photographing diamonds but in minute scale um my daughter thinks your website is just your Flickr account is just full of diamonds she loves them loves them <laughs> well hey they di diamonds are crystals right uh, absolutely and in fact i've i've even photographed some some rough real diamonds uh Ooh. and uh and they have crystal facets very similar to uh you know, to, to what you would find on a snowflake yeah. this is so beautiful uh so it's so, so it's very simple I, I don't mean any disrespect by that just the the quality of it is is just simply beautiful but there's a lot of work that goes into creating something like this this uh oh thank you uh, alistair i appreciate that this is what i, I asked what if all the time with my photography <laughs> um and what if i try this what if i uh, so in this case the question was what if I make the bubble its own light source, not shining it from behind, but I used an ultraviolet flash uh, that I had custom made myself uh, to illuminate a bubble that instead of water, uh, I substituted in invisible ink. 
that fluoresces blue under ultraviolet light and uh, then blew the bubble, hit it with the flash, and now you have a an invisible ink glowing blue bubble um, that is its own light source. Of course you do. I mean, that's obvious, right? That's <laughs> And that's what I mean. Is I, this... I, I, needed to, I needed to tell it to everybody because, <laughs> well, we just got to go through the motions here, even if it's obvious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's such a... Uh, this, this really captures me by its simple beauty but I, you know, I knew just how much work you and, and thought you had put into to creating the possibility of this maybe working, and then for well, all to come together, a failure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, like at my first experiment, I tried to take fluorescing pigment and mix it into pre-mixed bubble fluid. Complete and utter disaster. Uh, the pigment was not soluble in whatever the bubble fluid was. And I realized that my flash had a light leak that was non-conducive. And there was a bunch of uh, red light bleeding through the scene. And um, and then I went back to the drawing board. Like, okay, well, that didn't work. But I'm still excited because now yeah. I got some result. Uh, see how I can get the result I'm actually looking for. Yeah, incredible shot. Um, again, this this doesn't look some natural. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's entirely natural, although it does look like something out of science fiction. Absolutely, um, it's like a token so, to get into a, an alien spacecraft or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, the, the, the bottom left corner is slightly malformed. It's not a perfect uh, hexagon, mm -hmm. uh, which typically means that that part of the, the crystal was attached to another snowflake. And it didn't mm -hmm. have as much uh, available water vapor to, to, to form fully on all sides. But the color is what gets me on some of these things. Now, that's the same physics that puts color into a, like an oil spot on, on, on asphalt or uh, you know a soap bubble, you know, when you get the rainbow colors in the, on yep. the soap film. It's uh, it's called thin film interference, and, and this type of optical interference can happen inside of a snowflake as well. However, it hadn't really been documented well until I stumbled across it um, uh, during this photo series. Uh, uh, many years ago, I, I found my first ones, and, and so far it's, it's been a recurring theme. Um, because you don't see that when you photograph a snowflake using transmitted light, which traditionally has been how you'd always do it. You'd put the snowflake on a plate of glass. The light would come from the from the, uh, the the opposite side yeah. through the glass, through the snowflake, and into the camera lens. Um, and you would never be able to see these color patterns. The only way you can get it is if you get reflected light off the surface of the snowflake. Um, and based on the thickness of a bubble trapped in the ice, uh, will change the colors that you see in the snowflakes. It's not common. Uh, yeah. I would say maybe one or two snowfalls a year here where I am, where it's snowing constantly, will uh, produce colorful snowflakes like this. Um, but uh, if I'm avidly going out and trying to photograph them uh, at every opportunity, I get that one or two a year uh, mm -hmm. that are really a, a nice little show off piece. Yeah. When you first saw this, were you kind of looking around thinking, where's that color coming from? <laughs> Well, this wasn't the first one that I had photographed, yeah. but yeah, when I first discovered like rings of color inside of a snowflake, I, I, I mean, I like to find out why, you know, and uh, I, I've written at length about how snowflakes form and it's, it's a nice little simple physics puzzle. They're just very simple rules that put these things together. Uh, but I couldn't explain that. Uh, and so mm. I talked to physicists and scientists in different fields and finally found the answer to it. But that was a fun journey that I wouldn't have gone on had I not had a camera to discover something like this. Yeah. Incredible. Okay, now we're getting to some of the behind the scenes shots. Ah, th this is how those freezing so, soap bubbles are made. Yeah, so we're going to go through a series, of, a short series of images here looking at uh, create one of those bubble pictures. So I'll let you talk us through what we're looking at here, Don. So again, flashlight. Now in this picture, it's a bigger one than the one that I was holding up, but any flashlight will work. A flashlight tends to have a beam that spreads out. I mean, that's what they do. Um, but you want to have a, a light source far enough away from the bubble that you can kind of remove it from the frame, but with a condensed enough light that you know, serves your purposes. So I put a Fresnel lens, you can see it on my patio table there in my backyard. Uh, it's upright on the table. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it is just going to recondense that light back down to a tiny spotlight that you see 
on the uh, the opposite end of the table where I would be uh, crouched down uh, looking into roughly into the flashlight, which you see in the next shot um, that would uh, illustrate sort of the, the alignment of the, the different ingredients that show yeah. how uh, how it all comes into play. Now that light was super bright. Uh, so I could get away with doing some of this in open shade in the early morning. Right. Um, but if you have a dimmer light, you'd probably have to be playing closer to uh, to dusk uh, to, to make that work. Yeah, I don't know if people can see my cursor on on the screen. You should be able to. But th th that what looks like a sheet of glass, that's your Fresnel lens, right? Oh, yeah. It's also called a sheet magnifier. You can mm -hmm. buy them on Amazon for a couple of bucks. It's just molded plastic um, yeah. that functions as a, a fairly inexpensive lens. Yeah. Focusing the light onto that bubble at the side of the table. So there you go. That's a better shot. So there, there you can see that Fresnel lens that I just, I maybe I'm lazy. I just leave it all outside. That's why it's got like frost growing on it and stuff. Uh, it's still good enough for what I want. But what you can see here is that, yes, I'm in open shade. You know, the sun is out. Um, and I've got a bubble there. And this is the exposure for the overall scene, just showing you how all those different elements come together. Um, and again, I think I'm using a, a third hand tool, the, the helping hand tool with a little alligator clip, just holding up that Fresnel lens uh, on that angle. And you've got this tiny little uh, area, uh, this bubble. If I expose for the bubble, which I think you have that uh, as an image of uh, as well, this then you'll one. see... Um, exactly. So that's that's exposed for uh, the freezing bubble itself. And obviously, I would be framing this much closer in to just that bubble. But you can see how the light is above it in the frame, the actual light source. And so I can take a picture of this bubble glowing or appearing to glow without the actual flashlight in the background uh, muddying up parts of the frame because you know your eyes are always going to go to the brightest part of uh, of the image where if the flashlight itself uh was in the image it would be a very big distraction so this is how yep. we avoid that uh and uh and kind of line things up properly okay i think you have the the kind of results you can How get. How far from can that. you take it? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, you can juxtapose seasons very easily. You just take those uh, the same uh, uh, Gerbera daisies that I use uh, in my water droplet images. Um, just leave it outside for an hour. It'll turn into a solid piece of ice. Uh, just don't take it back inside. It'll turn into like a puddle of goo. But um, in this case, there's one light that is illuminating the uh, the, the freezing bubble on top. And th there's a secondary light that is just adding in some fill light on the bottom of the flower. Otherwise, it would be in mostly silhouette. Um, so two lights to make this one happen. But uh, again, it's just OK. You, you get kind of bored photographing a freezing soap bubble on snow. And then, oh, here's another freezing soap bubble on snow. How can you switch it up and make things a little bit different? Uh, oh, very easily by, by throwing a flower into the mix. Yeah, because it's not easy enough. Yeah, <laughs> true. Uh, it's great. Uh, I think uh, I think that's a great insight uh, into uh, what it takes to to photograph these bubbles. I, you know, before chatting with you, Don, had no idea what the the tricks and the techniques were to do this type of thing, and I, I didn't for a minute think it was your patio table on the deck of your house that had, uh, you know, a, a a Fresnel lens that was sitting there permanently so that you could just go out and play whenever you felt like it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Nobody else is using that table in the wintertime. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so lots, lots of uh, great uh, tips and tricks there, Don. I really, really appreciate you sharing them. If you've enjoyed uh, those tips and tricks, give Don a thumbs up, hit that thumbs up button. Uh, I know lots of you are really enjoying hearing that. So this is the last call for questions. Um, <laughs> Stuart Wood says, now get an ant on the bubble. There you go. Oh, There's Stuart. A... Um, yeah. I, you know what? Uh, I'll see if I can make that happen. I, you know, I'm, I'm crazy enough to try anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be crazy enough to try. I want to jump, uh, jump over to your Flickr account uh, because I really want to encourage people to go check out Don's Flickr account. The, the photos that you've seen today are only a small selection of of what you can dive into on his his Flickr account, everything from, you know, macros photography of animals and you know nature to these incredible 
uh, otherworldly images of you know natural elements here on Earth with uh, snowflakes and crystals. There's a, just a wealth of information. Some incredible, incredible photographs, but um, just the the information that they say are on Flickr account um, with your descriptions and details and exif and data. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you don't put a cap on how long my description can be. Because <laughs> uh, I'll usually write a written page or maybe a page and a half for an image and it never cuts me off. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, uh, we love uh, people sharing information and, and Flickr's are, been a huge you know, opportunity for people to uh, learn their craft and share their knowledge and, and get to know uh, a lot of the tips and ideas and techniques that go into it. But I think uh, something I'd love to highlight, if if you don't mind, Don, is is this. This is oh, your yes, your new book, and uh, if you have you know enjoyed listening to this show and you want to know more, in fact. If you want to know everything <laughs> there is to know about uh, macro photography, check out Don's new book. It's called The Universe at Our Feet. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this book, which I believe is on pre-order now, but I think it was a was it a Kickstarter before that? It was on Kickstarter. It's on pre-order. It should have been out by now. Everybody that's already pre-ordered it, I apologize. You know, pandemic and such. Um, but uh, I'm... I'm I'm putting I'm putting together the final touches now, and it is uh, well, Alistair, you, I sent you a sort of a, a draft copy. Yeah, wonderful uh, book of it. It uh, it is everything about macro photography, from lens selection to what happens with diffraction. We talked about that a little bit. An entire section on the water droplet stuff, the freezing soap bubbles and snowflakes, and so many other aspects of macro photography, how you deal with the subjects and how you deal with it in, in post-processing. Um, and so it's it's going to be uh, just under 400 pages as a hardcover book and an ebook as well um, that uh, I hold absolutely nothing back. And I'm, I'm thrilled that we're nearing the, the, the end of that, that the press is uh, chomping at the bit to get the files from me and they've been paid for the production. And I'm really happy to be just about ready to say, send for the files yeah, it's uh, go time. To, to get this, uh, to, to get this uh, uh, in, in press. And uh, the price is going to go up after I press that button. So you can check out my website at um, where I'm selling it, this particular book at uh, Sky Crystals. Dot ca and I think that's in the description for the yeah. uh, uh, the video here uh, down in the below. description here uh, and uh, you can take a look at that and uh, get in on it uh, at a slightly reduced rate before the price goes up I can guarantee you it's going to be worth it if oh, I'm not incredible. biased my opinion is pretty biased yeah it's, it's uh, <laughs> uh actually Gary uh, Gary Monroe's kind of put a phrase that says it well it's a tsunami of information it it literally is just everything you need to know from from gear, from basic normal gear to some of the specialist stuff, to some of the experimental stuff, to all the techniques, but it's also super inspirational. That the ideas you have in there that people can go try that which I'm desperate to go try now. Uh, it's it's an incredible book. Congratulations on putting that together and I know people are gonna love it when they get it in their hands. It's like drinking from a fire hose, be prepared. <laughs> yeah. It, you can go geek out on it for sure. It's an incredible book and congratulations again. So yeah, that uh, pre-order is in the description here. Uh, go show Don some some love and support by ordering that. It really is a wonderful book. There was a question earlier. I may try and find out if I can scroll back. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Wow, lots of comments. Um, the question was about um, workshops. Do you do in-person workshops. In fact, I think it here, uh, Sal asked, is Don go doing a live macro workshop? Of course, I mean, in the future after the pandemic. Well, and yes, after the pandemic. Uh, my wife works as a registered nurse in long-term care facilities. So I'm, I'm not I'm not seeing anybody for any reason right now until the pandemic is in the rear view mirror. Uh, but yes, I do. Uh, and uh, I have a studio here where I uh, I have students uh, that come and we we enjoy our beautiful gardens outside uh, for a full day of both indoor and outdoor macro photography. I also do water droplet refraction workshops uh, and other things like that. I, during the pandemic, however, I have transitioned uh, to doing some online workshops. 
and uh, you know over a number of weeks with image critiques and everything else in there. Uh, and I've got one of them coming up uh, with Princeton Photo Workshop. Great people there. Uh, and that I believe is coming up in, is it March? I can't remember. My, my schedule uh, is, is rather chaotic. But if you check out the Princeton Photo Workshop uh, website, you can see where that, uh, that course is. And I'm looking forward to, to doing that one. Uh, last time it completely filled up and uh, even virtual learning uh, can be quite advantageous when you're doing it repetitively week on week with the same instructor in the same group. So uh, yes, workshops, both in person and virtual. I love to do them. Yeah, and lots of uh, quite a few comments from people saying they've had the privilege of learning from you in person and how much they loved it. There was one earlier in the chat as well. So thank you for those wonderful comments. Um, there's a question here. Where exactly do you live, Don? Which part of Canada are you in? <laughs> I live about an hour north of Toronto in Barrie, Ontario. And uh, so we are definitely in a snow belt area. Uh, we got uh, lots of snow from the Great Lakes that come across uh, our, our yard here. Um, but it's very easy to get to. Uh, you know, if you're anywhere in the world, Toronto has its big airport. And we're an hour away from that. So I, I've had people come, you know, from other continents over here for these workshops. And it's just so much fun to, uh, to entertain and educate. But honestly, I leave those workshops as inspired as the students because everybody thinks about things differently. Everybody has a different what if moment. Yep. And there's a synergy about that. I just, at the end of it, I, I want to pick up my camera and uh, just go and shoot all the new ideas that other people had come up with and I can put my own twist on. Yeah, well, listen, I really appreciate your time today. We are going to at some point get you back because we haven't even touched on this stuff. Your ultraviolet photography. <laughs> yes. There's oh, that, so that would many be things. a whole other conversation and a really fun one to have that yeah. is far more accessible than most people realize. Well, there you go. Setting the seed for, for having Don come back uh, for another episode. Before I say my final thanks, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you have learned some stuff. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell notification. That way you'll be notified whenever we have another episode here on Smug Mug Live. We do have another episode this week. On Thursday this week at 11 a.m. Pacific, I'm going to be joined by the incredible Valentina V. And we're going to be talking about all things lighting and how to light images and how to use light. Uh, just she's an incredible educator when it comes to lighting. Uh, so join me on Thursday for that. But I know today has been a lot of fun for you. So Don, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. We're always learning when we hear from you. So thank you for giving us the time. And thank you everybody for watching. Don, stay safe. Look after yourself. And hope everybody stays creative at home. Hopefully this might have given some people ideas to pick Absolutely. up the camera and, uh, uh, and make some art. Yeah, a lot of people seeing how inspired they were. So wherever you are in the world, folks, stay safe, be kind, look after each other, and we'll see you back here on Smug Mug Live. But for now, take care. Bye-bye.